Hey friend, I have a quick message for you before today's episode. Let me ask you, are you having a hard time getting your team motivated? Do they feel disengaged? And of course, as you know, the, you are not alone. There's many people like you facing the same problems every day. What if I told you that you can motivate your team without even trying? Well, Karen, the guest on this episode, will host an online workshop for you that tackles engagement without focusing on motivation. You can see the details at uh, bit.ly forward slash Karen with a K, that's K-A-R-I-N underscore S-M-T-P. And the link is also on the show notes. Now, I can already hear you say, what do you mean without focusing on motivation? That's a great question. One of the main reasons Agile fails or doesn't achieve the outcomes we want is because we're trying to install Agile like if it were an app on top of an outdated operating system. It's like trying to install uh, a 3D game on top of Windows 95. The operating system on which we are trying to install Agile is the underlying management and leadership paradigm that the and the associated mindset that we are really blind to, that even I and maybe you are blind to. Uh, In this workshop, Karen explores a different leadership mindset and gives us the tools and exercises that will help us adopt this new operating system of sorts and overcome the need to motivate, which is really an old leadership paradigm focus, by replacing that need with a new approach, self-organization as it was meant to be. For more on that, visit uh, bit.ly forward slash Karen underscore SMTP. The link is also on the show notes. So if your vision is to develop a team or organization with highly motivated, self-driven and responsible team members, we look forward to seeing you in this workshop and introducing a way of seeing leadership that will help you develop successful teams. Uh, You can get the details at bit.ly forward slash Karen underscore SMTP. That was the announcement. Now on to the episode. Today is Thursday, so we talk about success for Scrum Masters. We've been sharing success stories here on the podcast since 2015, so there's a lot to learn. But uh, wouldn't you like to learn from people with decades of experience? Well, don't worry, we've got you covered. The Scrum Master Toolbox podcast launched Tips from the Trenches, the Scrum Master Edition audiobook. That's version 2 now out. There are 13 audio interviews, 3 hours of audio with Scrum Masters that have decades of experience. We've got Mike Cohn, Linda Rising, Lisa Crispin, Christopher Avery, Emily Weber, myself, your podcast host, Yves Hanul, the editor of the original Tips from the Trenches ebook, also available with the audiobook. Altogether, 13 super experienced Scrum Masters. To learn more, visit bit.ly forward slash audio tips 2. That's bit.ly forward slash a u d i o t i p s and the numeral 2 at the end, all lowercase, all one word. So, one more time, that's bit.ly forward slash audio tips 2 to learn more. And now, on to today's show. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Success Thursday this week with Ben Maynard. Hi, Ben. Welcome back. Hello, Vasco. Thank you for having me once again. Absolutely. So Thursday is Success Thursday, obviously, but we start with one of the tools we hope to use to achieve that success. That is, of course, the retrospective. So share with us, what's your favorite retrospective format and why? Which is one that I stumbled across, and I, I think that I've, I don't, I can't think where I got this from. I'm, I'm hoping maybe some, one, some listener can kind of add it and let me know at some point. Um, but I, I like things that deal in uh, anything that's sort of metaphorical, that allows people to draw analogies and, and talk about their reality um, in an abstract way. So my favorite retrospective format um, is. Using Lego, to which I'm a newcomer, I must admit, I'm, I'm nowhere near as experienced as probably many, many listeners in, in using Lego for these types of uh, for retrospectives. Um, but it, it worked fantastically well when I had a team that were was eight people. I asked them to take 
eight pieces of Lego. They could pick whatever pieces they liked. Um, and then over the course of five minutes to construct um, a, a model which represented the last sprint for them, thinking that there's one Lego piece per member. Um, and I, I was I was completely dumbfounded by how uh, different people had approached it and how no two models were in any way similar. Uh, but when people started to then explain what their model meant and how they were choosing to uh, visually represent their sprint and how they felt about the sprint or events that had happened during the sprint, everyone took a slightly different angle. Um, it created a lot of learning and it allowed people to point at something. And instead of saying, you know, oh, you know John really, really annoyed me on that point or I wish that I'd worked better with Sally in that instance, they were able to point at the model and, and, and talk about it in a slightly more objective, less emotional way, um, because it was it's about the thing they had in front of them, not about the the, the relationships which needed to kind of evolve and grow within the team. Um, so I found that incredibly, incredibly useful for that team in particular, who were having problems in the way they were interacting in their behaviours. Absolutely. One, one of the things that uh, I like about this particular approach, and uh, of course, Lego is just one, the Lego retrospective is just one example of this, what I would call metaphor-based or metaphor-driven uh, retrospectives, is that, as you said, it allows people to point to something. So it externalizes some thought, some feeling, some anxiety, or also some happiness, whatever that might have been in the last sprint. And th- for, for some reason, our brain works that if we can look at it and we can point to it, we can more easily reason about it. Yeah, there, it, it's, um, it's a wonderful thing. I've got a feeling that at some point I, I probably knew much more about this um, through some of the uh, training I've had from uh, Judy Rees on clean language, which is um, you know, a fantastic technique and, again, a great, great to use in retrospectives. Um, but it is, it, it's, it's powerful. It is really powerful. Yeah, the next stage on from there, it's, the problem is with retrospectives often, it just becomes a, um, a, a situation, you get so wrapped up in people complaining, you know, people people love to complain, it's the quickest way of getting feedback about something, is give people something to moan about, um, and they will, and they won't, <laughs> generally speaking, they tend not to hold back on it. Um, but, you know, but building this building this idea, and, you know, but by having this kind of cathartic session where people talk about the stuff and point at the thing and point at the Lego and see where people's minds have gone, uh, to then, you know, to put a more positive spin on it and to consolidate all of this and give people something to work with, um, was to then say, right, let's, let's bring these pieces together. You know, you've now got 64 pieces of Lego, you know, they create something collectively that represents how you want the next sprint to be. And to orient them towards thinking into the future and how they want to behave and what they can create together rather than what they create as individuals. Because this was a team, as I said, who had, had, their, had their challenges and they, they did tend to work as individuals at that point in time. So I wanted to kind of get them thinking more, more broadly about them as a whole and seeing that potentially you know, the, the sum of the parts um, is greater um, than, than perhaps they uh, would initially have thought. So to get them together, to create something together and say, look, this is what we want to achieve um, and to get a bit of that teamwork going, um, I found was a nice way just to, to further build on that. Absolutely. So now we turn our attention to success, the meaning of success for us as Scrum Masters. So Ben, uh, share with us, what's your own definition of success for a Scrum Master? Um, there's, there's two different sides to it. I would say that ultimately what I'm looking for is satisfaction of customers, users, shareholders, board members, um, whomever, um, and whatever balance of those people um, is one side of it. So effectively, you know, are we building the right product? On the flip side, um, it's then the, the engagement, the happiness, the, um, the overall feeling of the people that are creating the software. Um, uh, and, and, are they learning? Are they increasingly engaged? So effectively, are we building the product in a way that, um, in the way that suits where that organisation is? And what I will always do through uh, through conversation, through through surveying, through looking at other um, as many non intrusive measurements as possible to do um, increase my certainty that things are going in the right direction is, is to look broad at those things. It's the satisfaction of the people receiving the product or paying for it, or and or paying for it, and the engagement. Um, the learning opportunities and the growth of the people who are actually creating it 
And for me, those things together, that's, that's what success is. And of course, as Scrum Masters, we need to keep our eye on the ball, as it were, or on the score, for example. Uh, how do you yourself, how do you reflect on and how do you measure your impact and of course also the outcome uh, on satisfaction of the people receiving the products and the engagement and learning of the people doing the product? I think um, you can't underestimate conversation at all levels of the organization. Uh, I don't think that you could uh, underestimate the effectiveness of um, go see from a um, from a leadership and management perspective. Um, more often than not, when when a scrum master when scrum masters are asked to measure something, it has probably come from somebody um, maybe more senior than them, someone who yields some level of authority. Um, and actually, what they are asking to be measured. Um, is just a proxy for the reality. So I think that, you know, I'd, I'd like to see measurement sometimes as a as a last resort and to view it from the perspective of, well, what do you need to see in order to increase your certainty that things are going in the right direction? Um, that being said, I do like a cleverly worded um, engagement survey. I've been a big fan of using the Gallup Q12 survey as a basis and kind of elaborating and extending that. Um, and asking people in software development teams. Um, yeah, my, my, my history is predominantly in software development. That's why I talk about it so much. Um, yeah, but looking at questions such as uh, looking at questions such as uh, how fearful are you of uh, um, making a change in, in the code base? Um, how what's your confidence level in predicting the effect of a commit? Uh, those types of questions can be quite insightful. Um, also, questions such as you know, how often do you do something the way you've been told when you think there is a better way? Now, the data that you get from that is is interesting and useful, but is nothing about a conversation to really understand the context behind it. So um, at best, those measurements should provoke a conversation. One thing which I've uh, only recently started to really um, talk about and uh, uh, to advise and at times request of people is when, when looking at end-to-end future cycle time um, to extend that kind of cycle time to not when something is released into production, but from when you actually have meaningful feedback from the people that are using it, whether that's positive or negative, but to help make sure that you're orienting people to say, well, hold on, if we're going to measure our cycle time, and know, you know, know how long things are taking to get out, let's not pretend that simply putting something into production is releasing value. Um, because at the moment, it, for all intents and purposes, that that hypothesis has yet to be proven until you've got feedback to either confirm or, or not confirm that hypothesis. So extending the cycle time out to receiving the feedback, I think, is a, a very interesting measure in, in many contexts. Absolutely. That's a, definitely a great addition, uh, if nothing else, at least to complement the traditional cycle time measure. Ben, thank you very much for sharing that with us. My pleasure. Thank you. Part of a successful Scrum Master job is to help the product owner. Tomorrow we explore that critical role in Scrum, the product owner role. Tune in to learn about the product owner anti-patterns, what you can do to help the product owner, and a real-life example of what a great product owner is and what made it so. Tomorrow on our Friday product owner episode. See you tomorrow. We really hope you liked our show. And if you did, why not rate this podcast on Stitcher or iTunes? Share this podcast and let other Scrum Masters know about this valuable resource for their work. Remember that sharing is caring.